final panel of our conference on judgment and value in the humanities. And we've titled this panel, Personal Experience in the Humanities. I'm really happy to give just brief introductions for our speakers. Uh, Theo Davis is professor of English at Northeastern University. And her work focuses on, on experience of different kinds from our sense of embodiment to our experience of reading itself and how that experience gets figured into literature. Uh, Theo Davis is currently working on two book projects, one called Somatic Awareness, Teachers of Embodied Consciousness, and one called Attachment Issues, Explorations of Intersubjectivity in American Literature. Uh, and she's also got two books behind her. The first was Formalism, Experience, and the Making of American Literature in the 19th Century. And the other was Ornamental Aesthetics, The Poetry of Attending in Thoreau, Dickinson, and Whitman. And her remarks today are called, uh, it's called Human Figures. We also have with us Jonathan Lear, the John Neff Distinguished Service Professor at the Committee on Social Thought and in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago, and Director of the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society. His work has focused in different ways on the philosophical understanding of the human psyche, and ethical implications of different ways of understanding that. I won't uh, list all his books here, a few of them, Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation, Aristotle, The Desire to Understand, his most recent books, Wisdom Won from Illness, Essays in Philosophy and Psychoanalysis, and The Idea of a Philosophical Anthropology. The title of his talk, uh, I have to apologize for our poster. The real title of his talk today is When Megan Married Harry, A Comment on the Humanities. And responding to both and managing the Q&A is our own Noreen Kawaja, Associate Professor of Religious Studies here at Yale, who studies the shifting status of religious ideas and norms in late modernity. Her first book on existentialism is called The Religion of Existence, Asceticism and Philosophy from Kierkegaard to Sartre. And she's now working on two books, a monograph on the relation between theory and philosophy in the humanities, and a longer book on the emergence of authenticity as a cultural ideal. So we'll start now with uh, Professor Theo Davis. Thank you, Brian. Um, just give me a minute to get my PowerPoint up and running. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much to um, all of you who organized this symposium. It's a real treat to have the chance to share some of my work with you and to be here virtually. Um, and it's also just been uh, a real pleasure to be here listening to such an amazing group of talks. I feel like maybe we're at the point in the presentation, in the symposium, when I can also thank the previous speakers who've uh, already done a lot of work to make this a really valuable couple days uh, that we've all spent together. Um, so you see my talk does have a subtitle, it's Human Figures, Motion and Attention in the Civil War Stories of Rebecca Harding Davis. My focus today is on the stories of Rebecca Harding Davis, a prolific 19th century American writer whose one well-known piece is Life in the Iron Mills, published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1861, and recovered in 1972 when Tilly Olson republished it with the feminist press. This story appears to center on a sculpture of the human figure made by West Virginia factory worker, Hugh Wolf. While the story presents a background of wasted human life lacking in feature individuality or purpose, the comment that workers have dull besotted faces bent to the ground is typical. The sculpture made out of iron waste called coral gives a human form to subaltern life. And in this regard, the story follows a traditional element of the humanities in that it locates dignity and value in the delineation of the individual human form, which stands in opposition 
to devalued formless life. However, I want to suggest that the figure of that sculpture and the logic of the disavowal of other life that it entails is less central to the story than it first appears. It's always struck me as weird when critics refer to Hugh Wolf as the central character in Life in the Iron Mills because there's a dispersal of focus throughout the story that makes it confusing to say there even is a main character. In fact, one of her other novels has the same issue and the editor insisted on calling it Margaret Howe, who's really not the main character. So there's this problem of focus in all her work. Life in the Iron Mills is much more interested in forms of interconnected motion and observation among and across characters than it really is in singular figures. A passage in which Wolf looks out his prison window, at this point he's been imprisoned for taking stolen money to support his art, highlights the difference between his attention to individual form and the moving interest that Davis's narrative eye has. A tall mulatto girl following her mistress, her basket on her head, crossed the street just below and looked up. She was laughing, but when she caught sight of the haggard face peering out through the bars, suddenly grew grave and hurried by. I think at this moment, the passage shifts to Hugh's perspective. A free firm step, a clear cut olive face with a scarlet turban on one side, dark shining eyes and on the head, the basket poised, filled with fruit and flowers under which the scarlet turban and bright eyes looked out half shadowed. The picture caught his eye. It was good to see a face like that. He would try tomorrow and cut one like it. Davis sees this possibly enslaved woman's motions crossing the street, looking up, she sees her emotions too, from laughter to a seriousness and being taken aback by Hugh's face. Hugh, in contrast, sees a face like that, a picture, as if oblivious to the interaction. In such moments, I see Davis moving towards a clear aesthetic of figural multiplicity and of interacted being with that is opposed not only to a general aesthetic of individual figures, but to the ethos of individualism. And she sharply disagreed with Ralph Waldo Emerson on this point. Thus, while previous critics have focused on the aesthetic interest of the Coral Woman sculpture, which does have elements of neoclassicism and realism within it, I'm suggesting that for Davis, the real aesthetic interest is not the figure or the sculpture, but the motion between figures and the way that the narrative eye follows and responds to it. In a way, I'm just extending a classic argument about 19th century American women's writing, that it is more interested in forms of social being than in individualism. But I also think Davis pursues a path quite distinct from that of most sentimental and domestic writing by other women at the time. Davis's aesthetic is seen explicitly in Iron Mills's framing by a conversation between the narrator and reader that ends with the narrator having moved to a corner of her library where the sculpture is usually behind a curtain, but tonight is accidentally drawn back. The dynamism of her relation to the sculpture is emphasized when she observes, I see a bare arm stretched out imploringly and remarks, I turn to look at it. In such passages, we see this art of looking and moving in relation that characterizes not only life in the iron mills, but also John Lamar and David Gaunt, which are both published in the Atlantic in 1862. The three pieces pursue a narrative aesthetic focused on the way figures relate, often echoing one another or picking up a gesture and extending it in a different character's body and on forms of interactive watching. At times the sense is of watching motion, but often motion and watching emerge as kindred forms of being in relation, a conjoined fabric of interaction. In delineating this account, I'm inspired as I have been in my recent work by the developmental psychologist Daniel Stern's account of the generation of subjectivity in repeated relatively small interactive patterns between infants and their mothers, first outlined in his book, 
the interpersonal world of the infant. In these pre-verbal experiences, often involving interactions of gaze and gesture, a self develops as a set of internally represented generalizations of interactive experiences, which Stern called ways of being with. The sense of the person here is found not in the visage or bodily shape as such, but in an embodied consciousness manifesting on a moment to moment interactive basis. I've been interested in what this general account of intersubjectivity can help us see in literary history. Today, that means Davis's aesthetic of attention to bodily movement and gaze, as well as her understanding of the suffering within such caring gestures. Because Davis's attention often focuses on following along with small gestures of her characters, her work can be very confusing at a narrative level and yet startlingly distinct in its observation. For example, in David Gaunt, once it has been announced to Theodora that her father and lover have been killed in battle, she intuits that her lover's actually not dead and travels to find him. What happened hasn't really happened, and then her finding of him happens in peculiar stages. First, she locates the snow and weeds he fell in when shot. She knelt and found footmarks, one booted and spurred. She knew it. What was there he had touched that she did not know? He was alive. She did not cry out at this or laugh as her soul went up to God, only thrust her hand deep into the snow where his foot had been with a quick, fierce tenderness, blushing as she drew it back. The passage has a pace of kind of stilted, repetitive motion, which yields to this furtive insistence in the way she thrusts her hand in a pocket of snow. Soon she finds him in a shed. Douglas Palmer lay on a heap of blankets on the ground. She could not see his face for a lank, slothful figure was stooping over him, chafing his head. It's not only here that Palmer is on a heap, he seems like a heap, as his face and his body are effaced by the lank, slothful figure of Gaunt, who's actually her other potential lover. The effect of all this is that we don't get a strong figural image of Palmer, but instead these images of touching a snow pocket or laying on a heap while being stooped and chafed over. In a way, Davis's work reminds me of Leo Bersani's reading of Assyrian Reliefs in his book, The Freudian Body, where he finds an agitated erratic vision which substitutes related and continually shifting bits and pieces for the wholeness of being and linear movement of narrative forms. But if Bersani attends to deflection from human form and narrative meaning into formal agitation as such, which he sees as a displacement of violence. In Davis, connections may be in motion and often slipping in and out of focus, like the hand that goes in and out of the snow, but they are there and they are importantly uh, characterized by compassion. She lived in West Virginia and her home was near the site of the Wheeling Convention at which in 1861, citizens voted to reject Virginia's move to join the Confederacy, which would lead eventually to West Virginia's founding as a free state. This was then a liminal part of the country in which federal and Confederate abolitionist and pro-slavery people were in immediate social contact, as is dramatized in the story, John Lamar, in which Confederate Lamar is held in jail in a shed in the middle of a stubble field on the property of his old friend, the federal captain door. The story opens with the image of this shed and it's one prisoner being gaped at by a sentry, a raw boat hand from Illinois. There is a black man waiting outside the jail. Davis observes he's a field hand, you can be sure, from the face, a grisly patch of flabby black with a dull alluding word of something you could not tell what in the points of the eyes. Treachery or gloom. 
Although many of Davis's critics have followed Tilly Olson in categorizing her racism as occasional, I'll be suggesting that it's actually complexly central to her work. For now, note how the story has jumped from the sentry watching Lamar to watching the field hand. Even with the harsh account of his face as a grisly patch of flabby black, there's an effect of confusion. How is he related to the sentry and the prisoner? Who or what are we watching? We cannot tell what's in the hand's eyes. We cannot tell what the focal point of the opening paragraph is either. Once the hand asks the prisoner, whom he calls Marcia John, for tobacco, we understand their relation. The sentry named Dave and Ben, the enslaved hand, now watch each other, assessing their relative subaltern status. The sentry is a northern abolitionist enlisted in the war to free the Uncle Toms and carry God's vengeance to the Legrees. Here they were, a pair of them. He sees Ben as a living Uncle Tom and the master Lamar is a Simon Legree wearing diamond studs bought with human blood. As Dave watches everything with the eyes of a reader of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Ben squints another critical survey of Dave and Lamar watches him with a lazy drollery. So it's a scene of curious mutual watching around a mere shed and this is the story. It turns slightly back at this point to Lamar's being brought to the shed, passing by a hedge which has kind of like holes in it that are packed with corpses. One soldier, apparently to taunt Lamar, shows him the small face of a child laid in the hedge, dead for days. Seeing that dead face reminds him of his young sister whose face in a miniature he carries looks uncertain what to do. These dead and uncertain child faces held in an unexplained pendant relation give way to a discussion between Lamar and Dor. Without notice, Davis jumps to Dor's view in which Lamar is a man whose full life soul was wakening, but still undeveloped. And then she shifts again without notice to Ben for whom old thoughts of freedom were creeping out of their hiding places through the torpor like rats to the sunshine. There's a parallel here between Lamar and Ben's awakening. But if Lamar tells Dor that as the white southerner comes out of his sloth, the black will rise with him, Dor retorts, Ben knows it is his right to be free already, right now. The three men at the opening look at each other. The two children's faces that cannot seem to see look parallel out of the story. Now three new men are in view, two of them speaking to one another the third one watching and listening. Davis's own eye hones in on Ben, who is unseen really by both Dor and Lamar. He comes close to his master, touching him with a strange affection and remorse in his tired face as though he had done him some deadly wrong. Ben comes alive to his wish for freedom here, watching his master as he betrays him by becoming his own person. Davis notes again, in the shade of the shed, Ben watched Lamar. Indeed, he clung to the familiar face as if it were some relic of the shore, an object of safety and reliance that he's casting off. He awkwardly stood up only to then sit down in the crusted snow, looking vacantly about him, a man at last, but with freedom feeling there is nothing to look at or to. Lamar has tasked Ben with helping him break out of the shed jail so that in his view, we will be free tonight, meaning him and his slave together. But at the critical instant, which Davis does not actually describe, Ben instead kills Lamar by stabbing him. Davis breaks again, almost imperceptibly into Ben's view. They have broken down the wicket. He saw them lay the heavy body on the lumber outside. It's a totally confusing moment when we don't quite realize that Ben has knifed Lamar and is now beyond the shed in the dark, watching them take his body out and lay it down. After this point, Ben stops out beyond the farm's boundary and he imagines coming back to kill Dave the sentry 
or returning to the plantation to perhaps seduce Lamar's sister. Davis then notes that Ben hesitated a moment in the cleft of a hill, choosing his way exultantly. This curious instant shows his freedom in a delighted sense of being able to choose emotion, of having a possibility of orienting himself. Despite the fantasies of revenge and flight, he ultimately hasn't gone anywhere, as several paragraphs later, he's heard laughing from the hill as Lamar dies. Ben stays to be near Lamar without being subjected to him, in effect. Here, the image of the sculpture from life in the iron mills resurfaces. Lamar's face, paling every moment, hardening, looked in the moonlight like some solemn work of an untaught sculptor. This sculptural figure hears Ben's wild, revengeful laugh from the hill. The figure then is still in relation as Lamar realizes that it was Ben who killed him. At this point, the sentry boatman from the story's beginning reappears. He seemed like a nobody for the whole story, but he appears here. He was trying to stanch the flowing blood. Lamar looked at him. Hall saw no bitterness in the look, a quiet, sad question rather before which his soul lay bare. He felt the cold hand touch his shoulder, saw the pale lips move. Was this well done? They asked. The sentry had expected Uncle Tom and Simon Legree and finds instead the angry, sad laughter from the hill and Lamar's stunned sense that perhaps he deserved to be killed. At the story's opening, Dave the sentry is said to be nursing his musket across his knees, baby fashion. His maternal aspect relates to his reading of Uncle Tom's Cabin a book in which the maternal reader, of course, is named explicitly. In an iconic passage, Harriet Beecher Stowe, having narrated Eliza's flight from slavery with her son Harry in her arms, turns to the reader and asks, if it were your Harry that were gonna to be torn from you by a brutal traitor, how fast could you walk? This is a classic example of sentimental literature's form of asking white middle-class women readers to watch subaltern figures with an eye that is once objectifying and identificatory. We might look for a parallel in the following sentence about Ben. As for Ben crouching there, if they talked of him like a clod, heedless that his face deepened in stupor, that his eyes had caught a strange gloomy treachery, we all do the same, you know. But actually what we all do the same is not suffer with or like Ben, but fail to see him. The white characters perceive Ben as like a clod and don't see his face undergoing a dulling that becomes a subversive hatred. And we all, Davis suggests, fail to see that change. The sentence pivots off the logic of sentimental identification into a swirling, elusive attention. And this is confused further by the fact that Davis and the reader, unlike we all, actually do see Ben's expression here. The mobility and insight then of Davis's narrative watching is already evident in the sense that the faces which are watched and the faces which do the watching seem in the story to be switching back and forth all the time. Recall the two children's faces, one dead, one uncertain where to look, put next to one another in the story sequence but never fully seeing one another. The quality of objectification and clarity that Mark Stowe's work in Uncle Tom's Cabin are utterly absent in Davis's much more specifically observed and strangely crafted writing. In Davis's attentive aesthetic, as in her image of the nurse mother boatman, there is then a revision not just of sentimentalism but of the logic of domestic motherhood at its center. Certainly her depictions of mothers are marked by a seeping hopelessness. In the wife's story, the life of a wife and mother is described as groveling every year nearer the animal life. A brutal judgment, nothing that happens in the story can ever erase. It ends with the wife grateful to be reunited with her husband and baby, but it's a cold reunion. She held up the baby to be kissed by the man who had affected the reunion. He played with it a minute, 
then put it down. The mother doesn't seem to take the baby back, but to impassively watch it be set down, not unlike Ben watching Lamar's body be set down on the lumber. Another story out of the sea has a woman named Phoebe who's had a child out of wedlock who then ran away to escape the shame of her degradation and stinking and foulness. The boys become a famous doctor who dreams about pictures of the ideal mother and her son while Phoebe's been waiting 20 years for a letter from him. When he does come home, he barely survives a shipwreck. In this weird gender bending scene, Phoebe heroically saves him from drowning, but eerily as he lay there looking her straight in the eyes, in hers, dull with the love and waiting of a life, there was no instinct of recognition. Her mother love has actually dulled her eyes so much that she can't recognize her own son. In another story, The Harmonists, in preparation for joining a utopian community, Dr. Knowles claims to have set aside love and family affection so that his son Anthony comes cl no closer than any other. Knowles tries to leave Antony with the narrator at one point to break the child of what he calls a foolish habit of sleeping in my arms acquired when he was a baby, only to then spirit him off in the night like a sensitive, nervous woman. Later, the narrator finds Knowles missing, only to discover him one burly arm around his boy. If the story shows the undeniable force of parental love, and I would actually say his love is maternal as he is another one of these kind of woman man characters that uh, Davis keeps producing. It also shows Knowles' shame and disavowal of that very impulse. This is not sentimental domestic motherhood as we find it in 19th century American women's writing. Jean Faltzer notes that in letters to her close friend Annie Fields, Davis's only reference to a pregnancy is the observation, I am doing the kind of knitting I've never done before. <laughs> I find that really funny, it's like so threatening. Davis suffered a serious episode of postpartum depression after the birth of her first child in 1863, a crisis which entailed elements of religious doubt. At this period, she was deeply averse to Calvinism and evangelism of all sorts and hostile to the hypocrisy she found in most organized religion. She remained a Christian, but there was terror and despair, as Sharon Harris notes, that never fully left her. The despair is not only of Christian redemption and her role as a mother, but of human progress as such. In 1859, three years before life in the iron mills, John Stuart Mill articulated in On Liberty, a liberal vision of man as a progressive being in which the ability to grow and develop was the central value of a human life. In her fiction, however, Davis expresses an existential despair at the impossibility of such progress for the majority of human beings, including the working class, African-Americans, disabled persons, and white women. The wife and narrator of the wife's story, for instance, wants to leave her marriage to fulfill her dream of being a singer. She aspires to transcendentalist self-development, noting that the quotation, the only object in life is to grow, was my father's, Margaret Fuller's motto. She opposes self-development and being free to being animal life and woman's flesh. But again, the story is about the mistake of her entire understanding of self and world. The end insists on the importance of her life as a mother and wife, even though as we've already seen, it does so in a very crushing vein. Davis repeatedly describes the impossibility of progressive individual achievement and is in a sense committed to experiences of degradation and dependency. This is where her racism and even her anti-feminism in a strange way matter because her interest is in experiences of limitation which she refuses to see as adequately addressed by the aspiration to a fully developed life. Now in sentimentalism, degradation in this world is affirmed as a sign of transcendent value to be rewarded by the reader's sympathy and redemption in the afterlife. But Davis's work as so many critics have observed is not really sentimental. 
her interest in observing non-transcendent experiences of interaction and in emphasizing the value within experiences that from the perspective of progressive humanism would be characterized as degraded moves in a direction that is in some ways resonant with work in black studies by scholars, including Ashil Mbembe and Alison Kersine, who both in different ways look at aspects of motion, including crawling, that emerge from within subaltern experience and are seen as a source of value. Certainly an interlacing of blackness and whiteness runs throughout Davis's work, often with the kind of skipping from figure to figure um, we've seen in passages already discussed. Against the grain of 19th century American literature, for Davis, the sense of being clawed, flesh, or somehow disgusting and confused is never clarified into a matter of facile, objectifying sentimentality. Recall the rejection of Lamar's idea that he and Ben are part of a shared process of development. That's something she importantly resists. Still more striking is that she doesn't just use racial difference as a means for the white figures to project and then disavow their own experiences of degradation. When the turbaned black woman sees Wolf's face staring out from prison, she turns away in distress as if the sense of her own oppression is projected and possibly made vivid in his haggard face, taking away from her own free step. Davis has, I want to say, a sense of degradation that is neither the universal human condition nor a sign of transcendent value. It is experienced specifically by different persons in different conditions. There is even an important quality of degradation, the human interest, the compassionate looking and being with that is her aesthetic practice, focused so often on specific sensitively noted moments that feel rich with interest and yet incidental to narrative progress. I'm thinking here of Feltzer's point that for women writers of this time, claiming an identity as creators was extremely rare. She argues that being an observer might have felt more available to Davis, who unlike the radically exceptional Margaret Fuller had for higher education only what her brother was willing to share with her on his summer vacation and was, as Olson emphasizes, deeply aware that she was a backwoods outsider to the elite East Coast literary establishment. We so often think of the gaze as a form of objectification and power, but in Davis, it has a humility to it, even a sense of limit of their not being able to push further. Indeed, I think of her watchful narration as something like the eye of the mother for whom watching and careful attention can be exhausting and entail a sacrifice or dispersal of focus. Certainly, Dr. Knowles fights against his desire to curl an arm around his son because it cuts against his sense of self-direction. Davis knows not only the sorrow of parental watching, but the sorrow of the child's dependent watching and waiting for the gaze of the parent to bring them to light. I think it worth emphasizing how prevalent it is in this time for both women and black people to be seen as children, as dependents who had to look to others for their existence. She is fascinated by the ambivalence of Ben's watching of his master, first with affection for one on whom his life relies, then with rising hatred. After staring at nothing in the snow, he watches Lamar die from the hills with the shock discovery of what it means to kill the one you have looked to for existence. In our many critiques of the category of individualism and the human subject, we find opportunities to explore elements of humanity grounded in interaction and intersubjectivity. Davis offers much in this direction, but I wanna emphasize that her work also offers a sense of the suffering and degradation of our need to look to others manifested in her narratorial eyes looking, even though that looking is a matter of care. Despite the tremendous critical energy that has gone into decentering the human subject from our understanding of the humanities, Davis's work does indicate to me 
an unfamiliar and shocking rendering of human experience. Finally, there is a recurring thread of criticism suggesting that her value is in her movement forward from sentimentalism toward realism, um, out of the limits of 19th century aesthetics towards something more radical. All of these approaches value writing that moves forward, that heads towards a better future in some way. And I think this cuts against her fundamental interest in the lack of hope around human life. This leads her to a prose of watching that is also a way of being with, as Stern would put it. In Davis, this being with is at once loving and despairing. Here, love is founded in despair as it has no real plan to change or improve. In a human life which has no answer, her human figures concern ways of living in relation rather than living forward to an answer or end. So I wish at once to praise this marginally canonized but mostly ignored work as outstanding while conceding it is outstanding in the way it insistently inhabits its own compromised condition. Thank you. I think I go next. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, this may seem a bit like shifting gears, but uh, I actually think there's there's some commonality here in the themes. So this is called When Megan Married Harry, a comment on the humanities. Uh, I wrote it for this occasion. I would like to take a look at a particular call of conscience that marks us as human. The example may at first look trivial, but the fact that a call can arise even here shows us something important about being human. Now in her famous interview, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey asked Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, what are you most excited about in your new life? To which Meghan answered, I think just being able to live authentically. And she gave as her prime example, her wedding. Quote, I was thinking about it. Even at our wedding, you know, three days before our wedding, we got married. Here I've got some quotes. Good. So Oprah says, you know, uh, she said three days before we got our wedding, we got married. Oprah says, ah, Megan, no one knows that, but we got, we called the archbishop and we just said, look, this thing, this spectacle is for the world, but we want our union between us. So like the vows that we have framed in our room are, are just the two of us in our backyard with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And that was the piece that, and Harry says, just the three of us. And Oprah says, really? And Harry says, just the three of us. And Megan joins in, um, just the three of us. Now, though Oprah is a legendary interviewer, she does not pick up on what she has just been told. She says, the wedding was the most perfect picture, you know, anybody's ever seen. But that was precisely what Megan was calling into question, whether that most perfect picture was a wedding. Let us try to make Megan's point of view more explicit. As a social category, the type of event that the social sciences study, it seemed obvious that a wedding was about to take place. But something troubled Megan about that wedding being her wedding. As she told the Archbishop of Canterbury, that event was a spectacle for the world. And she added a crucial but, we want our union between us. That is, the planned spectacle was not going to be the occasion in which their union took place. What we see here is a protest against the idea that the planned event, the wedding, was adequate to the seriousness of getting married, that is, wedding. Now, where does that niggle come from? It seems to come from the very idea of marriage itself, at least as that idea is alive in Megan's thought and imagination. And let me say at the beginning, I have no interest uh, here in probing Megan's individual psychology, her inner world, or her deeper motivations, and nor will I discuss issues related to her character or the criticisms made of her in the media. I am here only trying to elaborate her self-conscious point of view. Megan wants to have a real wedding, not a sham. 
Her sense of her life as having meaning nudges her, and this is the call of conscience, in the, in the direction of doing something different than the planned public event. And she takes her doings to have been efficacious. She brought about a scene in the garden with Harry and the Archbishop of Canterbury, in which both she and Harry thought was adequate to their conception of marriage. And she takes pleasure in her success. She called it living authentically, and she said that was what she was most excited about in her new life. The official event on its own does not fit well into Megan's conception of meaningful life. And note, this is important, the special sense of meaningful here, as living up to Megan's own aspirations of significance. If Megan had simply resigned herself to the demands of social custom, went through the rit rituals with her heart in despairing fury, that would have been meaningful in some sense of meaningful, but not the sense that Megan sought and that we are tracking. Interactions, she expressed her conception of what it is to lead a meaningful life. And here is the point. We have a conception of the human by which Megan manifests her humanity precisely in striving to achieve her conception about what matters in living a human life. Now, this is a conception of the human that does not coincide with the biological conception of the human as a species, though, of course, the mode of our embodiment does matter to us tremendously. And it also eludes the human as an easily available subject of social science research, those beings who can be evaluated by categories reliably measured by the methods of social sciences. By contrast, the conception of the human we are concerned to isolate is essentially first personal, both singular and plural, in that it shows up in our living, imagining, and thinking, and is essentially normative in the sense that being human in this sense includes living up to certain aspirations and ideals that characterize us as being good at being human, and being human in this sense is being good. The human in this sense is humane. It is this sense of the human that the humanities tries to bring to light, both as theoretical inquiry and as encouragement. It is the clarification of a certain mode of self-consciousness that we as humans share. This special sense of meaningfulness as qualifying human life is one we learn by being impressed by exemplars, by other people who seem to be shining forth in their own attempts to live a distinctively human form of life, and then by our attempts in imagination, thought, action, and conversation to emulate and aspire to such lives ourselves. The humanities, when they are vibrant, form a family of communities of research, teaching, and conversation that develop understandings of what it is to be human in this peculiar sense of being human. And this activity itself partially constitutes our humanity, so understood. So let us consider the question, when did Megan and Harry marry? Now, to some, this question might seem silly or even unintelligible, and I think that too is important. It shows that the category of marriage has ceased to matter to such a person, that is, in the special sense of first personal perspective that we're trying to understand. The category of marriage might continue to matter, but in a different way. So imagine an atheist sociologist who believes that while marriage is an important social institution worthy of serious study, it is an institution that was formed in a religious context that is faded, and thus the question of when they got married is no longer one which is particularly meaningful. Still, she, the sociologist, might carry out rigorous empirical research about marriage, the social institution. Her research may have significant impact on, say, child health care policy. But then what shows up as mattering to her in the special sense we are trying to track is her sense of this sociological form of inquiry being important to her in her living of a meaningful life. Of course, the two senses in which marriage might matter to a person as something in which I might engage as part of my efforts to live a significant life and as a serious matter of theoretical inquiry, those two senses are not exclusive of each other in the sense that they both may matter to a single person, but they are different manners of mattering. 
Now, at first, it might seem clear that at least as a social fact, Meghan and Harry got married on the public occasion. That's what's gone down in the official records. That is the date on the marriage certificate. It is what all the newspapers tell us. And we have no less an authority than the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, um, I'm going to abandon my ability to put things on the, sh on the share screen and just read it out to you. It's short. Here's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Quote, the legal wedding was on Saturday. I signed the wedding certificate, which is a legal document, and I would have committed a serious criminal offense if I signed it knowing it was false, unquote. Now, one might think that that puts paid to any question of when the marriage, at least as a social fact, occurred. I have my doubts. It is constitutive of marriage, even in its socially accepted form, that to get married, both parties have to be in their right minds. They have to understand that they are participating in a marriage and be taking themselves to be entering a marriage. They may well be ambivalent or even think they're making a mistake, but they do think they're getting married. Now, suppose two actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company were outside rehearsing a marriage scene that they were planning to act on the stage that evening. The archbishop walking by misunderstood, and well-meaning fellow that he is, he joined in. The actors mistook him for the actor who would be playing the priest. It does not matter what piece of paper the archbishop signed. That would not turn this scene into a wedding. It would turn it into a farce. Now, imagine the public occasion from Meghan and Harry's point of view. From their point of view, they could not possibly get married on the public occasion because they already were married. They married three days previously, facilitated by the archbishop. A written document of those vows hangs on their wall. On the public occasion, from their point of view, they were only actors going through the motion and the archbishop was in on the act. The public, the public occasion was an act. And how could there possibly be a quote, legal wedding if neither party thinks they're getting married? Now the archbishop gives casuistry a bad name. Uh, he says that he uh, cannot discuss confidential conversations he had with the couple Fine, but the question is not about their private chatter. It's about whether he, three days before the public event, married them or not. He then goes on to talk about the legal wedding, as, his, as I quoted him. It does sound a bit weaselly to me. And I wanted to say, Archbishop, in the eyes of God, as best you understand it, was the legal wedding a wedding? Or did it, the wedding, occur three days before? He then follows with a, what seems to me a complete non sequitur. He says, quote, I, uh, I would have committed a serious criminal offense if I signed it, namely the wedding certificate, knowing it was false, unquote. Okay, but how about some intermediate cases like signing it without thinking much about what you're doing, signing, signing it thinking it was sort of true. In his statement, he puts himself on high moral ground but evades the simple question, when were they married? And in the Christian tradition, which the archbishop purportedly represents, the answer to that question matters. Now, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle tells us that in life we are all seeking, and we all take ourselves to be seeking, happiness or eudaimonia, though we may be unclear or confused about what it is. And this striving shows up in what we do and how we live, in Aristotle's conception of eudaimonia, happiness is complicated, but it certainly includes achieving the kind of significance Megan was striving for in her own attempts to have a real marriage. Now, what kind of significance is that? For Aristotle, each animal species has its form of flourishing, but our form is on a different level altogether. Our form of flourishing, happiness, uh, eudaimonia, uh, is, um, is, is, is unusual, and is, that's why Aristotle says that it makes, this is quoting Aristotle, it makes perfect sense that we do not say that an ox, a horse, or any other animal whatsoever is happy, unquote. And the reason he gives is that the other animals have no capacity to participate in what he calls kalan activities, 
That word kalan is translated differently in different occasions into fine, noble, and beautiful. Now, translators have felt the need to use these three terms, and I, I'm indebted actually to my wife, Gabriel Lear, whose work has helped me see an underlying unity in this concept. But for now, I just want to use the word kalan as a signifier for a concept we may not yet adequately possess, though we grasp some of its important marks and features. And so those of you who don't know Greek, just Kalan is translated as either fine or beautiful or noble. Um, importantly, the Kalan grabs our attention as Kalan. And the key to our happiness, according to Aristotle, lies in this, the active exercise of our ability to recognize and delight in, be amazed by, and motivated to emulate and imitate those exemplars of the Kalan that we experience in life as well as our success through practice in internalizing and identifying with the Kalan, so that having acquired human virtue or excellence, we in our life activities shine forth with the Kalan ourselves. Now, this is more than a necessary condition of our happiness, as Aristotle, for example, acknowledges that goods and good fortunes and ex material goods are necessary. By contrast, appropriate responsiveness to internalization of an active participation in the Kalan is what our flourishing or happiness consists in. So our flourishing, unlike the flourishing of other animals, consists in a special form of self-conscious understanding of our flourishing. The understanding is motivated and practical and thus essentially first personal. And that is why Aristotle teaches the conditions of human flourishing, not in his zoological works coming to the human, but in his ethics. Knowing what it is to be human in the special sense of knowing is a condition of our being human in the special sense of our flourishing. Now we can see Megan striving for this something special in her efforts to have a real marriage. The reality of the marriage, in her opinion, depends on it conforming to her idea of what makes marriage meaningful in this peculiar sense of meaningful. In this context, I think we should consider the interview with Oprah not so much as a retrospective report of an earlier event, but as a self-conscious elaboration of the event itself. Part of what it is to be Kalan is to shine forth as such. Now, of course, Aristotle thought that only a restricted elite would be able to appreciate the Kalan as such. And I applaud Megan's outlook, which is much more egalitarian. In the very act of having this interview, she manifests her belief that the whole world is capable of appreciating the specialness, the rightness of her marrying as she chose to do. It is important to completing a Kalan act to have it recognized as such. It's a way of building community. Her act, that is the private ceremony, plus the public declaration on Oprah, was intended as critique. For thousands of years, a certain social sect in Europe has insisted that their conception of nobility, which non-accidentally concluded themselves, was the truth about what nobility is. The planned marriage was meant to show forth how this form of nobility can adapt to the exigencies of modernity, the marriage of a royal to a non-royal. In effect, Megan insisted there was something ignoble about this attempt at nobility. It had degenerated into mere spectacle. The real marriage, from her point of view, the true nobility was the private event and its showing forth on Oprah. There now arises a question about the availability of conceptual resources in our culture. On the one hand, Megan clearly had the concepts of marriage and authenticity with which she wants to understand herself and to have others understand her. It is with these concepts in mind that she sought to break free of an oppressive cultural outlook and oppressive cultural cliches. But now we get to a question that affects not just her, but all of us. Should we ever be so fortunate as to achieve material and social circumstances that enable us to break out of some confining social norm? Are we then trapped one level up 
with confined and distorted concepts with which to make our purported escape. In her essay, um, the philosopher Cora Diamond uh, wrote an essay called Loss of Concepts. Uh, she argued that one aspect of growing up in unjust circumstances is that people regularly lack the concepts with which to understand their situations and themselves. On the one hand, Megan earned celebrity, wealth, and personal prestige on her own. She was then able, along with her husband, to structure a marriage as she saw fit. But what resources did she have to question what marriage and authenticity should mean for her? What freedom did she have with the concepts themselves? And I ask this not just about her, but because it is a problem that pervades our culture. And more generally, I think it's a problem that haunts human social being as such. And I think this brings us to the topic of this conference, which is the importance and value of the humanities. I think it helps to distinguish three levels of the Kalan. Um, and this distinction, I'll say, is just for heuristic purposes. In reality, there, it's much more complicated. There are intermingling's and overlaps. At the first level, there are people striving in their lives for significance. They are trying to live happy lives in the deep sense of happy. Then second, there are those whose first level strivings take a peculiar turn. They survey the human scene and try to give it back to us in poetry and fiction, philosophy, art, and other narrative forms. Sometimes they give us accounts of the Kalan as exemplified in heroes and heroines, but that is not all. Sometimes they portray humanity as a mixed bag of foibles, failings, and even evil, with perhaps a few moments of generosity and clarity. But there is something Kalan about helping us understand ourselves better, whatever the truth brings. And then third, there emerges this historical institution, the humanities, that is of its own nature dedicated to conserving, in some sense of conserve, these special uh, attempts to understand ourselves as human. It is a disciplined account of what we take to be our best first personal attempts to understand the human. Now, what is it about this form of studying the human, both the Kalan and its failures, that makes it Kalan? I want to say that the humanities properly understood is a special form of mourning. Um, and perhaps surprisingly um, and counterintuitively, mourning is a realm in which humans can achieve excellence. When we mourn well, it is a peculiarly human form of flourishing. I'm going to stick with Aristotle, not to promote him above others, but so that I can speak from personal experience. Um, Aristotle lived. While he lived, he tried to make sense of life, and then he died. That would be it, completely it, but for the relentless activities to keep him alive in thought, imagination, conversation, teaching, study, and emulation by generations of scholars, teachers, and students, each passing on not only the teaching, but the love of the learning from one generation to the next. And by the way, I'm leaving out life after death and being in heaven. I'm just not, not I'm just, you know, if that's true, that's enough. You know, that's another chapter. I've got something more to say, but as far as we know, that's it. It is in, in this sense, it is a matter of life and death. It's, um, it is not only because of it's, it is only because of all of this activity that I am able to speak to you today about the Kalan and how it might continue to matter to us. Freud said that mourning is a great riddle, as he put it, and that its greatness partly, well, this is from my point of view, its greatness partially consists in its not being the kind of riddle that gets solved. Mourning, Freud says, quote, um, is one of those phenomena which cannot themselves be explained, but to which other obscurities can be traced back, unquote. In essence, mourning is one of the important ways we exercise, again, what Freud called our, quote, capacity for love, unquote. We get attached to people and ideals, thoughts and projects that are themselves vulnerable. And we respond to that vulnerability by becoming active ourselves in imagination, thought, and emotional life, in making sense of what it all meant or will continue to mean. Other animals suffer loss. 
uh, you know, uh, other animals grieve in very complex and nuanced ways. And if we want, we can call that grieving mourning. But our form of mourning is an attempt to turn loss into a reanimated gain in imagination, thought, emotion, and Im importantly, symbolic expression. We make human meanings. When we can share this publicly, it is constitutive of our formation of culture. Aristotle lived, Aristotle died. It is only our activity that transforms this change into loss and into a certain kind of gain. It is via these types of activities that we develop ourselves as historical beings, beings constituted as beings by having pasts that matter to us. That is, pasts that partially constitute our present by shaping our sense of what matters to us in that special sense we're tracking. Thus, mourning, when done well, is a special manner of our distinctive form of flourishing. It is Kalan to keep alive in thought and imagination the best attempts throughout space, time, and cultures to understand the human from a first personal human point of view. And the humanities are a family of historical cultural attempts to keep this form of mourning alive in a shared public arena. So I think it's a mistake then to try to justify the humanities in instrumental terms as leading to an external good. For example, that if we study Aristotle, it will improve our critical thinking. And that if we are better at critical thinking, we will do better in our careers. That may be true, but it misses what the humanities is about and what it ought to be about in our lives. As a form of mourning, the humanities tries to keep alive the finest attempts to understand what matters about living a human life, all the while overcoming while maintaining boundaries of space, time, and cultures. We understand what mourning is, not simply in terms of what it is about, but by its manner. It is a manner of taking up the dead, the departed, the lost, in memory and imagination, and coming to life oneself in efforts to make sense of it. Sometimes evaluations of good and bad are employed. It's often emotion laden. Sometimes it's imagistic and dreamlike. But in all of it, we mourners are ourselves engaged. And mourning is essentially first personal activity, singular and plural. In the case of the humanities, and to stick with the examples we have been using, it's not just that we get opened up to thousands of years of extraordinary thinking and artistic expression about what marriage and authenticity might mean in human life. When things are going well, we develop a capacity for critical playfulness for recreation and change of the very concepts with which we are thinking. This is the manner of returning from preoccupation with loss, the past, to life in the present. The point of the humanities then is not some goal external to it. The point of the humanities is that it itself is a mode of our flourishing. So to come back to Megan, the issue is not that the humanities would have helped her instrumentally to make a more critically informed decision as though she were solving a problem in clue, you know, in the garden with the archbishop or at the palace with the queen. The question is not which is the right place as though there were, were a correct answer existing independently of her deliberation, but with what inner resources and what available cultural opportunities was she able to draw upon so as to turn the choice making activity into a deep understanding of who she is, what her freedom and flourishing consists in, and correlatively what the world she lives in mean, means. So, you know, to some extent, this may appear a trivial example with a, a shallow person. Obviously, I don't agree. I don't think that perspective, I think that perspective misses something important. And I think this bears on the question that frames this, uh, this conference, which is the question was, what is worth conserving? And I want to say, you know, there are different ways one might understand this question. And we should not assume we already know what it means to conserve. And some understandings of conserving are, in my opinion, quite problematic. But to begin with a positive construal, one of the most important aspects of the humanities that needs conserving is the capacity to transmit a sense of its own importance, a sense of the joy and meaningfulness internal to it from one generation to the next. The question of conservation here is not so much about what to teach, but how. And I think Megan is not unlike 
an entering student into the humanities. She is already struggling with issues of what would make her life meaningful. And of course, she's not yet internalized all the riches of the humanities. Um, that's what all entering students are like. And thus, I think her problem ought to be our problem as teachers and not grounds for dismissal. We ought to be able to address those stir stir stirrings for significance, no matter what a student's background. So what is above all worth conserving in the humanities are teachers, I think, proper teachers in the humanities. And in my experience, teachers do not emerge from classes on pedagogy, uh, though some may survive them. Uh, I think there are three overlapping features that make for an excellent teacher. First, they are themselves exemplars of the love of their subject. Many of the teachers who influenced me were not interested in me at all. <laughs> some were, and I think some may be here in this room, uh, and I'm glad about that. But in their teaching, they put on display their fascination with and dedication to an area of study. There was something marvelous in their efforts to study and teach something they found to be marvelous. And in a way, humanities professors, I think, ought to be conceived of as first responders to students' hunger for the Kalan not just by giving them large scale exemplars, but by being exemplary themselves in their manner of doing so. Linda Zagzebski has pointed out that with large scale cultural exemplars, we can be struck by their beauty or nobility or specialness before we understand what it is that's grabbing us. Now here today, I'm less concerned with these alleged exemplars of uh, supreme excellence. And I want to focus instead on our often very flawed characters that we encounter in everyday life, and indeed are, our teachers, who for all their foibles and sometimes bad behavior do have a spark about them. Of course, that opens room for show-offs and seducers. But right now, I want to concentrate not on how things go wrong, but on how things go right when they do. Part of what it is for things to go right is for students to see right before their eyes a manifestation of something special shining forth, not that far off, is something they could imagine partaking in, perhaps in a different form. Second, as I said, the humanities is a manner of overcoming while maintaining boundaries of space, time, and culture. One of the important reasons for teaching the humanities in an undergraduate curriculum is that by and large, it is not the sort of thing one can pick up on one's own. One needs to be taught skills of reading and writing, thinking and imagining, so as to be able en to enter culturally distant or temporally distant or geographically dif distant worlds, and in some remarkable and unusual way, inhabit them from a distance as a source of animating and deepening one's own life. The third feature is really an elaboration of the second. One needs to teach students how to play. To return to Aristotle for a moment, it was important for me to learn how to read the Aristotelian texts, to struggle with getting it right, to immerse myself in ancient Greek conceptions of psyche and eudaimonia and the Kalan and so on. But I was also encouraged into a certain kind of imaginary activity. What might Aristotle have thought about this? What if a new manuscript were discovered? How might we go on in an Aristotelian spirit with a contemporary challenge? This imaginary activity is at once mournful and playful. The question of who it is we are keeping alive in our imaginations goes, I think, into an enlivening abeyance. As Donica Donald Winnicott taught us, often we do not need to answer the question, where precisely is Aristotle located? These three features of teaching provide a clue to the intrinsic value of learning the humanities. The point is not, if you study the humanities, you will learn to think better, and then it is more likely you will get promoted in your job. You will then become rich and famous, and then you can do what you want. It is that for human life to flourish, it requires more than instrumentality. In that sense, I think the humanities is for the humanities. Now, none of these considerations is conservative in the familiar political sense of advocating a fixed canon of greats. 
And as I said above, there are ways of understanding the question, what is worth conserving, that are problematic. And I want to focus on one which following Kierkegaard, I'm going to call an aesthetic reading, but it's, you know, Kierkegaardian spirit of what's meant by aesthetic. In this version, we conceive of ourselves along the line of curators, and here with a capital C, at a great museum, or librarians with a capital L at a great library, or professors at a, with a capital P at a great university. There are so many works already in our basement, but there's not enough wall space in the exhibition. There are too many books for our shelves, or there's too much learning to fit into a curriculum, and we must make choices. But on the aesthetic reading, there are two unquestioned assumptions. First, it is left unquestioned what it is any longer to, to mean to be to conserve. We assume we already know what conserving is. The only issue is which items to choose. And second, it's assumed that the basis of choice will be educated judgment, but the question of what educated judgment consists in is largely left to the side. It is though the question were about the worth of the various objects of the humanities, as opposed to the worth of what we are doing in raising the question in this manner. It is that kind of questioning that is integral to the humanities and gets left out of the aesthetic reading um, of the question. So in, this is in conclusion, in this essay, I've tried to provide a response to what I take to be an ethical reading of the question. And in this vein, let me conclude with a word about my continued use of the term Kalan. My point is not nostalgic. I have no interest in you know, going back to ancient Greece, whatever that means. Rather, I want to use the term to signal a gap that for reasons we may not well understand, we may not have the concepts we need to understand our condition well. Each of the possible translations of Kalan into English seems to me to be problematic. Noble, carries connotations of thousands of years of European exploiters, thugs, and dissolutes, giving meaning to the term by putting on furs and shiny rocks and making others bow down and call them king and queen. Good riddance to them, and I say go Megan. Beauty carries with it the sense of aesthetic beauty detached from the ethical, and that doesn't strike me as okay. And fine signifies something good, but it's vague, and it doesn't pack the right aspirational punch. The point of my continuing to use the Greek word kalan is that it signals that we have a hunch, but do not yet know in sufficient detail what it is we're looking for. So the aim here is not to recover Aristotle's conception in the hope of returning to it. The society Aristotle inhabited was also unjust. So one should suspect that his concept of the Kalan was itself disfigured with the connotation of nobility legitimizing an unjust social hierarchy in which Aristotle partook. My stance is more platonic in spirit. We assume that both we and those from whom we might learn have been living in conditions of injustice which disfigure our attempts to understand what is good. I mean, in effect, uh, Plato's image of the cave is applicable. Still, we can get glimpses of a good direction to follow. Using the Kalan self-consciously as a signifier, not a fully developed concept, is, I think, a use useful direction in which to proceed. We thereby signal to ourselves that we have a hunch that both they and we are onto something important about being human, but we are also in the midst of life and thus in the midst of confusions, contradictions, and unclarities. But what seems to me worth conserving is the spirit of making our best efforts according to our best reflective understandings of what we mean by best. To travel all over the world, across space and time and cultures, in study and imagination, to discover and conserve what we take to be the best efforts of other humans to understand and express the human condition. It is in this spirit of rigorous hope um, that spirit of rigorous hope is, I believe, a manifestation of our flourishing. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jonathan and Theo, for such rich papers, which I have had an extremely fun time reading and thinking about over the last uh, days. I will try to keep my remarks relatively brief and interrogative to set us up for some discussion. Uh, I think there is quite a lot of intertext possible between these talks and, and certainly very fruitful ways of 
closing out um, this conference in and touching back on the main overarching themes. So I'll just get going. I um, starting with um, Theo Davis's paper um, on Rebecca Harding Davis's writing, looking at I, I was really um, uh, surprised and moved by the way um, you were describing the uh, what might be called like a kind of diffractive ontology of character looking at the motion, the interconnection, the kind of the movement of figures across and between figures, forming maybe a different kind of figuralism in the stories um, from what we might normally expect. And, um, you know, thinking about this is a diffractive reading. I was also sort of spinning in my thoughts, thinking of Davis reading Davis, writing about David, also about Dave. There were a lot of Davings going on here. But Davis one shows how Davis two in, in sort of exploring this diffractive character ontology can, get us at um, a sense of the existential despair in your phrase or the experience of degradation that is a reality for a majority of human beings. And that kind of lens, I think, set us up, set me up at least to think about um, a tension, an interesting tension between the figuralism or the figuration that you're tracing in Davis's work and something that at times you sort of describe as a humanism, and perhaps a sentimentalism in the writing or tendencies to read them in that way, 19th century humanism, especially in its progressivist narratives um, and its most individualizing narratives. And so some, some sort of tension there between the diffractive figural reading and perhaps a kind of uh, humanist framing for relationality. Um, and I thought there were some like beautifully suggestive and illuminating reevaluations um, in the course of that reading of the gaze as a kind of humil a form of humility as opposed to objectification and thinking about the ruptured perspective or ruptured form that emerges across those characters as something compassionate rather than violent. And sort of setting up to ask some questions about the relationships between these two papers, thinking about sort of a couple of passages that that um, that stood out in that respect. I'm quoting from uh, early on in Davis's talk. I'm suggesting that for Davis as a writer, the aesthetic object is not the figural sculpture, but the motion between figures, the way the, and the way the narrative eyes follows and responds to it. And you know, I sort of I dwelled on that phrase, the word aesthetic object there. That Davis's um, aesthetic object is this motion between figures. And I was thinking, is this an aesthetic object? In what sense of aesthetic? Is it a moral object? And then this sort of drew, drew some potential connections with what we were hearing at the end of uh, Jonathan's talk about the Calon. Um, but also I, I'm, I was aware of a phrase you came to toward the end of your paper about an aesthetic practice. So at one, at one point you called it an aesthetic object and later on you called it an aesthetic practice. And I think that ambiguity also, or that doubling sets up some interesting vectors that we might revisit uh, in thinking about them together. And I, I noted also in that, in, that, um, in that same introductory section that the person slides into your reading in a place perhaps where in Lear's reading, we hear the word human more centrally framing this discussion that the, the phrase, the person sort of sets in there. So that um, Davis's sense of the person is found not in the visage or bodily shape as such, but in an embodied consciousness manifesting on a moment to moment basis. And so, um, you know, I had a lot of really sort of broad questions about uh, some of the ways you're putting that, like thinking about um, what Davis's work, who I was discovering through this paper, um, might where that might sit, sit sit in a kind of broader history of literary perspective. Do you see her as a precursor to some of the modernist moves in thinking about perspective and ruptured uh, sort of voice? Um, but those are maybe not the most interesting questions for this particular context. One, uh, one, one sort of way of teasing it out perhaps um, is uh, what I'm trying to get at here is to say that sort of I was noticing um, a kind of complex overlapping between terms of the figural, the human or the humanist, perhaps the personal in there, and then a counterpoint between those and the sentimental. And I wondered, this is a word you didn't use, but because I'm hearing some art historical kind of echoes in the back of my mind as I'm reading this, that you know, another kind of antipode perhaps to the figural to be, to be put in here is the abstract. That is to say, would you, would you read the kind of figuralism that you're tracing in Davis's work 
as abstract um, or as a kind of abstraction? Is it is it akin to abstraction in some way? And so I think thinking about the kind of tectonic overlaps or shifts between the figural, the sentimental, the humanist, the personal, and the abstract may set us up to think a little bit about some of the methodological moves as well that, that Jonathan was kind of um, teasing out in the latter part of, of his essay. Um, I wanted to say uh, sort of also that I noticed, and this is, this, is a, this, is a, this, is a, this is a thesis and everyone feel free to refute it or contest it. So perhaps one way of describing one layer of a kind of connection between the two papers that I was really fascinated by is to see a kind of maybe ex, a, a loosely existential body of figures operating in the background of each of your writings and to see each of your writings teasing out um, two kind of countervailing tendencies within that body of writing. One is thinking about the existential tradition as focusing on a kind of decentered or eccentric subjectivity about the relations between things. So thinking about you know, Heidegger's philosophy, for example, as so prepositional. It's about the in and the with and the being between, all of which are you know, maybe his attempts to build concepts out of translation of Aristotle's prepositions or something like that. And then on the other side of the existential spectrum, not thinking so much about those relational kind of um, spaces of eccentricity and interwovenness, uh, but thinking about the function of that, that Jonathan Lear describes with this phrase, first personal or self-conscious, not embodied consciousness shifting moment to moment, but something more like mindness. Um, meaning to me, that special sense that he was talking about there. And so, you know, I, I don't think that that's a, a kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, celebrity death match of uh, subjectivity and a critique of subjectivity. I think there are playful ways that we could talk about that tension, but I wondered that's one way of sort of setting up for, for each of you to respond if you find that fruitful, to think about um, what that tension might mean to you and, and whether you see it as a tension or something that is uh, a little bit more aligned. So that's sort of question point one coming out of this. Um, I think it moving to, to talk a little bit uh, more on its own terms about um, Jonathan's paper, I think it's, it's, it was really um, kind of illuminating to me as, a, as almost, I was reading it myself as a kind of elegant, almost Kierkegaardian reading um, on a model of the kind of occasional discourses that he offers of the occasion of a wedding or the occasion of a confession or a conversion in which he's looking at a kind of seeming ritual or institutional event and asking, but did it really happen? Did they really commit? Did they really mean what they said they meant? And kind of interrogating them in that way. And then um, I was really convinced by, um, the gloss of Meghan Markle's interview with Oprah as, um, I, and I'm compelled by this, not, not a retrospective a report um, on an event that had taken place somewhere else, but rather a self-conscious elaboration of the event itself. I really like that claim a lot. And it sort of suits my own hermeneutic tendencies, but I think it also is appealing because of the kind of theoretical agency with which it um, views and invests sort of Megan's character in this story as someone really working out and theorizing her own experience. Um, I think that point also pulls at attention that I may have in your reading of that interview and which perhaps can help us wind back to another critical question to link back to something that um, Theo was saying. So uh, if, we read, if we read the Oprah interview as not a report on an event that it takes place somewhere else, but in a self-conscious elaboration of that event, that is to say, we see her interview with Oprah not as a spectacle, but as part of the um, hermeneutic work of living and living well. And then I think it brings me to want to do a similar or to invite you to do a similar kind of work with what you with the with the event of the wedding itself, that is to say, this, the distinction that you were drawing so sharply between the spectacle wedding and the real wedding on Megan's own terms. I wonder if we follow um, if we follow the uh, logic of your reading of the interview, you know, an Oprah interview is ostensibly, right, like the signature American institution of turning um, a public, of making private a, a conscience into a spectacle for, for public consumption. And so, you know, if we, if we read that not in that way, but as part of this kind of self-conscious working out, then why not see also the wedding as a kind of rendering public, an elaboration in public consciousness 
of an event that may have private meaning? And I think the stakes of that question um, uh, to you are um, in part um, just sort of, you know, what's, what's the right interpretation of this particular event, but also in part um, to do with the pedagogical frame that you sort of overlay um, in, in your reading of this event, right? Like sort of figuring Megan as something akin to an entering student in the humanities and um, as someone with a question, coming to the table with a question that perhaps only a teacher can help her fully articulate the terms of or the way through. And I wonder if this treatment, um, and I wondered a little bit about this treatment of her in, in, in sort of rendering her uh, in this kind of pedagogic relation, whether that, whether that adequately addresses her as not only a kind of character appearing on television and in sort of the public consciousness, but also something of an author of her own media play in which she herself is appearing, right? So that she is a manager of appearances in a lot of ways, as, as I think most of these kinds of celebrities are, and, and is kind of orchestrating a spectacle of celebrity morality for us to engage with and consume and think about in ways that I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, but, but if we think about it that way, right? So I, I, I was I was thinking about um, the words that re re recur in your in your paper, meaning and um, and human, which maybe I, I I missed something, but I I didn't actually see those in her own text that that she uses either the word meaning or human centrally in her own sort of in the transcript of that interview, and she uses this word authenticity that you're using to pivot from I think. Um, into these questions of meaning, which I completely understand. But I think there's another way of thinking about authenticity in the sort of media context that she is operating in, which is, you know, not just a search for the Kalan, but also a kind of defense of the singular individual against some kind of elaborate depersonalized PR machine that is the royal family, that is the media itself. And I'm hearing in the background here, perhaps re repeating some of the, the kind of counterpoint that Theo is setting up between Davis's approach to the figural as kind of um, at odds with or a counterpoint with Emersonian traditions of self-reliance and self-elaboration in something like a more individualist vein. So if we see Megan in, in appealing to authenticity, not just as a sort of genuine search for the Kalan, but, but articulating what is perhaps America's version of the noble cultural ideology that is everyone ought to be and make themselves up on their own terms. I wonder what that changes about um, the kind of reading you offer and about the pedagogical posture that you're attempting to sort of see her with. And, and perhaps just to kind of round this out finally to a, a pointed question, it's I, I think I could hear in um, listening to both of your papers, especially now after reading them, an, a, a potentially really rich connection between the palimpsestic approach to the humanities that Uli Jonathan was talking about and the kind of figural method or the aesthetic practice that Davis was tra uh, tracing in Davis. And to see, you know, perhaps the humanities as this metabolism of mourning and mattering in something akin to the way that um, Theo Davis is tracing this gaze as a way of weaving compassion and mattering and personhood across boundaries. There's something rich and suggestive perhaps in there. But then the question, finally, I'm arriving at it is, um, so what would a Davisian reading on the model of this kind of aesthetic practice of figural fragmented perspective and personhood, what would that do differently of the Meghan Markle if interview with Oprah? Would, that, would a reading in that vein produce a different account, a radically different account of that event and its interpretation, its elaboration? Um, what uh, would that difference matter? What would the difference matter? What would matter about that difference if it would and to whom would it matter? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I could, I could say more things about that, but, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Perhaps like the, the little pin is just, um, to say that, you know, one hook one might find into that is to say, is, um, the sense of the human 
that Jonathan was tracing in, in reading Meghan Markle's interview, something akin to the sentimental in Davis or not? That's like one other version of that same question. Take it up, please. I would love to hear everyone's thoughts or ask your own questions. Oh, that's a hard question and I feel I should be brief. Um, I feel like there's an interesting resonance between the two ideas of the human that the papers offer, but that it's a little like the children's faces in my paper that they, they don't actually intersect. I don't know that they conflict, but, but I feel more that they resemble each other and that there is an attempt to bring some element of the human into our consideration, which hasn't been directly a focus so much in this conference. And to see that as something that has to involve a sense of my, my own word would be limitation, which is quite different from flourishing. Um, but then again, with, with Johnson's brings in the sense of mourning, flourishing in that way is really importantly qualified. So I feel there's a resonance, but I, but I do think they're different because the individual in the way I'm looking at it in Davis is broken up moment to moment. And the hope of flourishing is present, but itself a source of suffering. And I don't think that's true for Jonathan's paper in the same way. Would, would, would you like to speak to that yourself maybe? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, I'll just say partly I'm conscious of people having questions and not wanting to take up much time. Um, I want to be very, you know, say thank you, you know, very much to Noreen for, it seems to be very thoughtful questions that take a long time to answer them. And I'm, I'm conscious of that. Um, but let me just say, I'll just say very briefly that, um, uh, um, you know, there, there's, one, there's one place I really picked up and I didn't, you know, um, there's a phrase you use about theorizing her own experience. And I, that makes me uncomfortable. It feels like uh, too much of a, a theoretical, you know, a picture of reflection um, that isn't really accurate to what I'm trying to capture or what I think she does. I don't think, it, I mean, it, it's, it is a manifestation of an important form of self-consciousness, but I worry about um, theorizing. I think she's, you know, she is trying to live a human life. And you said, you know, I, I, um, uh, it is true that in her text, the words that she explicitly uses are um, authenticity and um, marriage. Now, those are the ones I pick up on. But Megan, um, uh, sorry, uh, Oprah asks her, you know, what are you most excited about in your new life? And it's, so it's, it's a qualification of living a life that she... Um, uh, Megan answers with these questions. And then what I'm interested in is, uh, you know, sort of what shows up in the living of a life? What is the striving for? I mean, something happened to her, which, you know, I don't want to go in about her. I don't know about her, but, you know, just write the things that you can read right off the, um, you know, what she tells us is that uh, something was bothering her such that she needed to have a different kind of an event. Um, earlier that would be the real thing. And now then I think, you know, part of the humanities is, you know, giving us lots of places to go to think about, well, what is that move? What does that consist in? What is the hesitation about? What is the desire? And so I put it into the language of significance, be, not because I particularly like the language of significance, but it's one that's being used in the culture now. So you're trying to make the transition or, or talk to people about what's going on that's, but that's it. I mean, there's something about the significance of a life that's internal to the living of the life. And maybe we could have a better concept than significance. That's one we're living with now. But something is showing up there. And something is showing up there in her dissatisfaction with the official public event being, you know, the unfolding. It could have been one, you know, if, if, if she were different, if her outlook were different, it might've been one event, the private thing three days before and it's public declaration over um, in the public event, but that's not her view. Her view was this was a sham and she needed, but she needed something else. And, you know, again, the Kalan, <laughs> you know, we, we may learn some good things about it. You know, there may be other things we don't, but what one of its markers 
is trying to point to something important, hum, importantly human, which is we would like our significance, you know, to be recognized and appreciated as such and approved of, you know, seen the way we'd like it. We'd like the way we see the good about ourselves to be appreciated by our community. And thus there's reason to think, you know, it's again, you don't, you could conceptualize it all sorts of ways, but there's something to be seen in trying to see these two, two things as one, the, 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 what she took to be the marriage and what she took to be the presentation of the marriage to the world. We have several hands. I think Yiping was first um, and, and um, why don't we start with that? Maybe we should take, does anyone think that we should take two questions at a time? There's some nodding that I see. Nobody, no, Jonathan says no, Jonathan is indifferent. Okay, let's take, let's, Yiping, why don't you go ahead and then we'll see what we can do. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, this is actually a question for Jonathan that might actually be just another way of asking what Noreen was asking. Um, but I'm, I'm confused about the juxtaposition of Megan's interview and Aristotle. Um, so maybe you can help me um, to understand that more. You know, I, I kind of think that for Aristotle, um, there aren't any issues of bad faith um, in spelling out what it means to live an exemplary life, right? So to be Kalan in, in some sense is to be self-evidently so, um, or at least for Aristotle, self-evidently so to the right audience. Um, and that's not the case in, you know, the show in this kind of Oprah show, right? Um, as Noreen pointed out, right? Another viewer could say, well, oh, that performance on Oprah is just carefully choreographed to help build this personal brand that's now her primary source of income. You know, it was just the three of us and the photographer um, who took the pictures that hang in our wall and now Oprah and now the rest of the world, right? So I'm not saying that's what I think, but I, I think the problem I'm interested in is that, you know, um, whereas you see this attempt, um, you know, to be Kalan in a deeper sense, right? Others might equally read that as just another moment of narcissism or selling out. Um, you know, the act itself has this curious opacity to it. Um, and I'm not interested so much in what that says about Megan, right? But the problem is that that opacity seems to be an ineliminable part of the concept of authenticity, right? Which simultaneously rejects spectacle and rejects theatricality while also being, as you put it, normative or aspirational. Um, and towards the end of your talk, you seemed like you wanted to deconstruct Aristotle's sense of Kalan as publicly available in some kind of unproblematic way, but also keep its lack of opacity so that, you know, what uh, I think is significantly good about myself can be appreciated by my community and so on. Um, can you say more about how that would work? Like, how do we do that when authenticity is a concept that problematizes even like the first person judgment on themselves? But, you know, you said something earlier about authenticity. I didn't quite understand them. Just the just when you began to talk about authenticity, what was the point you were making? I think I missed it. Um, well, so I think I was saying that I think, you know, in some sense, the, the opacity of that uh, act and how to read it, which as a cultural critic, you would have to look at it on both sides. And I think you did a good, uh, you know, a, a very convincing job of pointing out a side that maybe many people would overlook, right? Uh, but you know, she invokes authenticity, which I think, you know, is simultaneously this rejection of spectacle and theatricality, right? Like any act that I would do so that other people would recognize it as such is tainted in some way and it's a problem with the audience and so on. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, it's this normative or aspirational act. So it has to, you know, there has to be a, a criteria, uh, you know, there has to be a way in which I'm authentic or not, right? Um, and and it just gets us into all those yeah. problems of, of yeah. also bad faith and, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think I understand you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I understood you before about authenticity. Thank you. Okay, so look, I mean, um, firstly, there are lots of ways one might understand this encounter and event. And I am not um, trying to claim that I've got the right one. Um, I'm trying to elucidate a possible way of looking at this and why it might matter. Now, authenticity, I just want to say is, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, one of the great things about doing the humanities is you can see, you can see over time in cultures, there have been many, um, you know, disparate versions of authenticity. And, um, uh, you know, and of course, that might not be the right, the best, you know, if she, if you were well-educated in the humanities, 
Um, you know, one might decide authenticity isn't the right concept for me. Um, you know, part of the idea of freeing one up is not only freeing one to think about the concept differently, but uh, also to think, well, man, <laughs> you know, maybe we're done with this concept. Let's have a different one. But this is the one she used and invoked. And, um, you know, the, as far as I can, I mean, as far as I know, I'm not an expert on the concept, but I mean, the original meaning of the authenticos was the murderer. Um, you know, that's how it begins in the Greek, the, you know, he did it with his own hands. <laughs> it's the one who, you know, the one who really did the strangling is the authentic um, person um, because it's, he took it into his own hands, or the neck of the person he killed. And, um, you know, it's came to mean genuine, the authentic, you know, the, you know, um, the authentic item. And over time, and, and I think, you know, partly, you know, what I think of as a mistaken reception of uh, Heidegger came to take on meanings of privacy that, um, you know, that's one way to go, but it's, you know, I don't think it is the way, um, you know, I, I don't, it isn't particularly mine. Um, so, I mean, can I, can I suggest that we, I, I, I don't want oh, to interrupt, sorry. but just that we have so many questions and I thought we maybe- Oh, we sorry, I, well, what, what can no, I no, say? No, no, you, you've, you've, I think, convinced us that there is a lot of uh, valences to that term and we can revisit maybe- well, Anyways, we'll thank you. I, we, we can do this offline. Um, no, yeah, so maybe Michael and Akil, would you ask uh, your questions first, Michael? Then. Um, thanks, and, and uh, I, uh, 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 this question is really for Theo. Um, but I think also for Jonathan, and it's kind of maybe a, a you know a connection I noticed between the papers and maybe fitting at the towards the end of this um, conference is that both of the papers seem to involve a kind of um, skewed relationship to religion um, or, or or to certain kinds of religious uh, uh, traditions. Theo, I was really interested in your account, uh, a very persuasive and, and elegant account of um, of Davis as a kind of um, refusal of, of, of the kind of Christian redemption of suffering, right, um, uh, that, that animates uh, uh, some versions uh, of the sentimental. And, 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 and Jonathan, the, the, um, it's kind of interesting the way that the religious, you sort, of, you sort of invoke it, marriage as, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury is there, right, but it, but it, it, it gets displaced um, by these questions of, of authenticity and, and, and so forth. And so I just wanted to invite, you know, thinking, you know, thinking back uh, uh, to people like Matthew Arnold, you know, the way these questions ha had, been, had been raised uh, uh, would have been thought of uh, a century, a century and a half ago, just to speculate or, or talk a little bit about what was underlying, if it was in fact underlying your papers, um, uh, uh, references, to the humanities as that which comes at an angle, fills in a space left vacant by, um, uh, 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 creates figures that are, um, you know, not available in uh, uh, religion. Can we answer, or did you want us to hear the other question? Maybe hear the other question, then and see and see where to go from there. Akil, would you go next? Um, this question is addressed to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, uh, very enjoyable to hear you as always. Uh, I was extremely interested in your uh, bringing on to center stage uh, notions like mourning and keeping alive and, and conserving. Um, it, it does seem to me insightful to, to focus on them, uh, but of course they'd have to have a very uh, general scope. I mean, they wouldn't be mourning in, in the nar narrow sense. So, so, so just take, for example, you know, uh, over the uh, previous semester, uh, a, a semester or two ago, I was teaching and, and I noticed that when I mentioned the date 1789, uh, uh, the event seemed to be alive, but I, I then went on to talk about 1848 and 1871. There's just no uptake on the part of students. I mean, the event was just 
you know, I don't know about dead, but it was lifeless or it was moribund. Mm -hmm. And this has not got to do with generational illiteracy or anything. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, be superior in that way. I'm just saying that, as you rightly point out, things, things just uh, 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 pass away and you might want to keep them alive. And so the idea of keeping alive is, is important and, and conserving is important and, and so on. If I, if I think the Paris Commune is more important than, than uh, uh, the French Revolution, I'd want to keep things alive, uh, 1871 back onto. Uh, okay, so, so, so having said all that, it does seem nevertheless that there are certain kinds of things that by their very nature we do not mourn. Mm -hmm. And the question is how we don't want to usher them out of the humanities. So for, so for instance, when we seek truth in the standard sense, right, in, the, uh, uh, in inquiry, if something that we believe uh, turns out to be false, right, there isn't, there's, a, there's one sense in which we can't possibly mourn it if truth is our goal. It, uh, uh, is the goal of inquiry, right? I mean, you can mourn it in the sense, in a completely different sense. You can mourn it in the sense that you say, I did, the world was a better place to live in. I myself was a happier person when uh, uh, the zeitgeist had it that the earth uh, is flat. But just from the point of view of truth and cognition, you can't possibly mourn if truth is a goal of inquiry, you can't possibly mourn that you've found something false and gone on to see that something else is true, you know, that the earth is not flattered. So, so I would think that there's a danger that the humanities would have to usher out a notion of truth of that kind, the unmournable by its very nature. Uh, if, if you make uh, mourning and regret and things like that, you know, which which make us special, which we do in a different way from uh, uh, non-human creatures and so on. It's just a question yeah. about we don't want to usher out certain things, and and so those the scope of mourning and so on is is relatively limited. Therefore, may I answer back, Noreen? Is that or yeah, I, I wanted uh, Theo to go first and, and address Michael's question. I made a bad call in lumping these two together, but we all have to pay for it now. Sorry. I think I can be um, sort of quick. You're right. There's a skewed relation to religion in the paper. I feel in a simple way, I'm positioning her between a progressive humanism that sees our development in this world as what gives life value and a Christian idea that sees our development towards heavenly hopefully judgment is what gives our life value. And she doesn't really fit either of those. And instead there is a kind of care that is focused on a sort of despair of value coming and where we go next. I think that has an aesthetic quality to, in her work. I would be tempted myself to say that arguably that is a religious position, if not the conventional Christianity of sentimental American literature. So a general to the humanities, I, I would hesitate to make that big claim. I, I wanted to stay specific. So. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think let me let me go to it, 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 to Akil's um, question, um, which I think is really important. Um, I just want to say a couple two things. I think one is I think um, I, for me, I'll say I, I think you know one of the best ideas that um, psychoanalysis has um, discovered. I mean, Freud. I think it begins with him, but then it's a long tradition. Is that um, mourning properly understood is really a constitutive and pervasive aspect of the human condition. Um, I think it's a really big idea. It's a really important idea. And the, you know, from a, and I don't mean to go on about psychoanalysis now, but other than to mention this, but I'll just say, you know, from a psychoanalytic point of view, you know, the very idea of respecting and honoring and even recognizing the truth 
requires understanding that this thing is separate from me, this truth that I'm acknowledging. And the separate, you know, understanding separateness requires certain mourning given the kind of creatures we are. Um, so it's one place I, you know, a failure of, you know, my presentation today is I, you know, didn't have time to talk about mourning with the kind of length or depth that it deserves. But secondly, the, the specific point you make about mourning, um, you know, the, the, I, I really disagree with you uh, in that I think part of what it is to um, let go of, you know, falsehoods is to mourn them and get them over with. I mean, you have to, you know, some, you know, bad, 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 you know, not all love affairs are good. And, um, you know, um, but you can't just sort of, this is one of the things that puzzled, this is why he cottoned on to mourning at all is of interest. Why is it that we're not creatures who can just move on uh, when we just, you know, we, it's part of our, um, you know, uh, our, 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 you know, it's central to our erotic nature that we, we, we it, you can't just move on. We have to mourn the, the falsehood at least many falsehoods, some of them we don't care about, but the ones we cared about, we have to mourn them to move on. And so, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't think we should mourn it in the sense of keeping up an idolatry of them, but as a way of moving on. I don't think I was being clear then, Jonathan. I, I really don't mean to deny that there is much to regret or mourn when we realize that something we believed is false, but it's not regrettable from the point of view that we have when we inquire into truth. It's regrettable in all sorts of ways, but those are yeah. surplus accretions uh, that accompany the inquiry into truth. I'm saying just from the point of view of that goal, it can't be that one uh, doesn't want it. And I'm saying that goal with that narrow conception of it, Maybe we want to usher it out of the humanities, say it is only for the natural sciences. And, uh, you know, and I, I, just, I, I just wanted to, to alert you that, that you might have to go in that direction. But I really had in mind that narrowness. I want it to be a necessary truth that you can't mourn it. When you narrow it down in that sense, it's not a controversial point. Um, well, I'm not sure we agree about the controversy, but I just want to say, I don't think mourning essentially involves regret. It might, it, it's not an essential property of, you know, that it need, that need be. But it doesn't matter, mourning and, anyway, I, I think, uh, I think we have to, we disagreed here, but perhaps on very fundamental things. Okay. <laughs> um. Disagreeing on the terms of the disagreement is another definition of the humanities, perhaps. <laughs> um, so uh, there were hands, they disappeared. We are at our edge of allotted meeting time, but I wanna uh, thank uh, the speakers of this panel and previously, and I wanna hand the reins over to David Bromwich, who I think is gonna say a few final words and signing us off. Um. I was asked to say final words, uh, and uh, yet the uh, last talk we heard uh, was uh, uh, so much a peroration, an envoy, an elegy. Uh, <laughs> and this conference uh, isn't mourning for itself, but it didn't want to quit. So uh, I'll relieve us of any remaining burden by being very uh, short. Um, one of my favorite uh, sentences uh, or rather even just phrases from the history of criticism uh, is in uh, Shelley's defense of poetry uh, where he describes sympathy or one could even say defines sympathy as a going out of our own nature and an identification of ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought, action or person, not our own thought, action or person not our own. And I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers uh, for making thought, action, or person not our own in their several instances, something closer to our own. And to pick up uh, just on one point in that last talk, uh, we should add maybe the, the, along with uh, the beautiful, which exists in thought, action, or person, 
the remarkable, the original, uh, the playful. Um, and to say that if something has come out of this conference, it may be a definition of the humanities, part of which is that it helps us to uh, make things of that sort partly our own by contemplation, uh, by association, and by study. Uh, so thanks to all of our speakers, thanks to the patience, interest, and acuteness of the audience. Um, there was a lot of work that went into this, and not only by me, but I'm glad we did it. Um, so thanks again.